Hey everybody, uh, we're here again. I don't know if this video will take. It seems to, YouTube seems to be having some problems or my internet connection, whatever. But in this video, what I want to talk about is God and His Word and how that God's Word is the plumb line for our lives. You've probably heard that in sermons. Um, you know, many Protestant denominations and pastors and seminary professors end up saying that, that God's Word is the plumb line for our lives. And they go into great orations about how, you know, that is supposed to be the, the ultimate uh, guide for our lives. You know, biblical instruction for living here on earth or, you know, whatever that little acronym is for the Bible. But unfortunately, what happens is the majority of people who say they believe in the Bible don't know what the Bible actually says or teaches, and they'll go to extremes. One extreme is that they'll say, okay, well, I believe in grace, and I believe in faith, and I believe in love, and in spirit, and the whole nine yards, and that the law has been done away with. You know, we, we, we're not under, we're under a new covenant, we don't have to obey the laws of God. The Sabbath, the feast, uh, what God tells us to eat that's good for food, no, nope, that's all been done away with, you know, when the Messiah came. But yet the Messiah himself says, I haven't come to destroy the law of the prophets, but I've come to fulfill. And that word uh, fulfill is pleru, which means actually the, the better translation is fully preached. Paul actually end up says uh, later on, I forget the reference, but he says, when I have fully preached the gospel, and then he goes on to say, well, that word fully preached is pleru, the same word. So when we understand the, the Hebrew idiom, of what the Messiah said in that passage where he says, I haven't come to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. That is a Hebrew idiom back in the day when the rabbis, and Yeshua was a rabbi, otherwise they wouldn't have called him rabbi or rabboni. <clears throat> he said that was a phrase that said, I, I'm not destroying the law. That was a common phrase. I'm, I'm properly preaching. I'm properly interpreting it. I'm fulfilling it. I'm, I'm not taking away or adding to. It is fulfilled. It was complete. That is what that term means. So <coughs> let's say if you're talking to Scripture with somebody way back in the day and their interpretation of Scripture was off or a little bit wrong, then what would end up happening? Uh, what would end up happening is to say, no, you're destroying the law. You're destroying the Scriptures. Well, that's why the Messiah said, he goes, I'm not destroying the law or the prophets. I'm not taking away or adding to what I'm doing is fulfilling, pleru, fully preaching. I'm not, I'm causing it to be complete, so there's nothing missing, taken away, or nothing added to, okay? God's Word talks about that. Don't add to or take away from my Word. We see it in the Old Testament, we see it in the New Testament. So God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, okay? He doesn't change, and that's, that's proof right there. The problem is, is that in today's Christianity, uh, the Protestant denominations, many of them will say, the law has been done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. If you observe the Sabbath, it's a, it's a burden. It's a curse. You've fallen from grace. You're a heretic, and you're, there's no hope for you. You're, you're, a child, you're a child of the devil. You know, I mean, it's, they, you know, why would you want to go uh, under the burden of the curse of the law again, you know, when you've been set free? The problem is what we've been set free from <clears throat> is not the law. The instructions that God gave for our benefit and blessing. For example, if we're told do not steal, and we steal, there's a fine, a punishment, and a penalty because we sin against God ultimately, because all sin is sin against God. You break one point in the law, it's like breaking them all because it all comes from the lawgiver, the one who gave all the instructions to his God. But we also sin against our neighbor when we steal something. So there is a curse to that. We have to repay what was stolen. Uh, there's enmity between us and our neighbor or the person that we stole from. But yet when we're obedient to the commandment of God that says do not steal and we don't steal, it results in blessing. We're not caught up in that sin that we're separated, that relationship is strained between us and our neighbor. The relationship between our, us and the Father isn't, isn't strained and there is no um, distance between us because we have, uh, you know, we've broken the commandment, the instruction of a holy God who wants to have the relationship with us, which can only be had by the Messiah who died on the cross, it allows us to have that access, allows us through the forgiveness of our sins, then we have that relationship with him. Well, it, it, yeah, I'm going to keep going, but let me just get back to this part of extremes. So some people will go to the extreme and say, you know, the law has been done away with. <clears throat> Sabbath, the feast, that's all Jewish things, and they weren't Jewish things. So it's almost as if there's been a veil 
that has been put over the eyes of the Protestant denominations in regards to God and, and obedience and his word and his instructions, Abraham, you know, God said of Abraham, you know, the reason to do this covenant thing is because he obeyed my voice, my law, my commandments, my instructions, my statutes, my principles. Depending on the translation you read, it's, it's the law, the commandments. And there was other people that actually obeyed the commandments of God. Uh, I think it was uh, John the Baptist, his parents, it says in the, in the, the early uh, Gospels, one of the early Gospels, it, it escapes me, but it says that his parents obeyed everything that was in the law. Wow, even Paul himself says, you know, when he was uh, charged with uh, breaking the law of Rome and uh, of the law of God by the Jews, he, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says, I, you know, when he was kind of like Yeshua, he was, he was falsely accused of breaking the law uh, of God's commandments. And he says, no, no, Paul said, no, I have neither broken the laws of Rome or of my forefathers. I believe everything that is written in the law and the prophets. Wow. Okay, so that just wrecked a, a lot of theology there for some people. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, we're not called to believe in a denominational belief system. We're called to believe on God's good doctrine. So it's almost like there's been this veil that has been Im imposed on people, uh, you know, and it's only been, uh, you know, it hasn't been that long since that veil has been placed. You know, you can, yeah, you can go back in time and you can say, well, the veil actually started uh, you know, when uh, uh, the Gentile believers, the foreigners and the Jews used to go to the synagogue and then there was persecution and then they said, okay, well, if, yeah, if I, you know, if I do the Sabbath and the feast, people are going to know who I am. So, yeah, we'll just kind of take it easy. We won't do those as much. And then, if, you know, full blown, it got into the Council of Nicaea or Constantine, which finally ended up saying, hey, anybody that does anything Jewish. So now it's morphed instead of the Sabbath of the Lord whom Constantine supposedly had a revelation from God, a seen a cross in the sky. <clears throat> now Constantine suddenly understood that the laws of God, which he said were forever and perpetual, have now been done away with, and we need to, to torture and kill people and make it illegal to observe the feasts of the Lord and the Sabbaths of the Lord. They were my Sabbaths of the Lord, if you look back. Hmm. So, so, so something went wrong. It wasn't scripture. It was mankind who morphed its way and changed and said, hey, we're going to change this thing on our own. We're going to change the Sabbath. We're going to change the times and the seasons and, and the law, uh, which, by the way, in Daniel 7.25, it says that the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you call him, the guy in the red suit, uh, has said, <laughs> you know, he's going to come to change the times or the appointed times, the seasons, the, the feast of the Lord, and to change the law, the commandments of God. Isn't that what he did in the beginning? God gave the commandments, and, and uh, what did the enemy do? The serpent in the garden? He says, hey, did God really say? Hmm. Yeah, it's the exact same thing. He wants to change those times and seasons. He wants to change God's laws or even do away with even considering the laws of being obedient to. Because if he does away with the concept that we have to be obedient and that the law has been done away with, then what we're doing is lawlessness. Okay, We're acting as if there was no law given at all. Hence the term lawlessness. The law is less, and we don't even have to deal with it. Okay? But, so that's one extreme. The other extreme that we end up having is people that, that think that um, Yeshua isn't the Messiah, and I'm talking mostly to, to the Jewish people, folks who don't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. They think, you know, of course, they're, they're commanded by the rabbis to not even read the New Testament, uh, that even having a New Testament in your Bible in your home as an Orthodox Jew, that's that, that, that's a sin. You're not allowed to read it. Um, it's considered heresy. I mean, you're basically excommunicated from the assembly if you do things like that. And so uh, there's more on the other side of the coin. We have the veil that has been placed over the eyes of the Jewish people. But the cool thing is, is that God says in his word that that veil will be lifted. So... <clears throat> Consider it this way. You have the temple, and you have the court of the Gentiles, and you have uh, the Jews that are in there, and the Hebrews, and uh, the proselytes, and everything. And then you have the Holy of Holies, and there's that veil. The thing is, is that when that veil was ripped open, now we can see that the, the Jew and the Gentile goes first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile that salvation comes to. But we will see that 
God's law, his commandments and instructions, combined with the grace that he portrayed on all people uh, by the Messiah, being that Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, that change in, in the law was that, hey, this is the change. The, the Messiah came. There's a change in the priesthood. He's going to be our forever priest. It's not going to change from time to time. And that sin has been forgiven once and for all. And that God's spirit was poured out on Pentecost and Acts. So now that God's instructions and his spirit resides in us so that we can be obedient to his instructions and walk just as the Messiah did. But yet you'll have people who say, well, that law has been done away with, the Sabbath has been done away with, <clears throat> Yeshua isn't the Messiah. It's, we get two extremes all the time. And unfortunately, what we end up saying is that people will say, you know, well, I'm part of the new covenant. You know, we're talking about the, the, the grace, loving, live in the spirit type people who say that the law has been done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. You know, it was the handwriting of ordinances that was written. The, the debt, if you actually look in the Greek, it's, a, it's their written record of debt of where you transgress that law. That's the handwriting of ordinances. That's what that phrase means in the Greek. It doesn't mean that the law was done away with. And like I said in previous videos, <clears throat> you know, you break the speed limit. You've, you've broken the, the written, uh, the letter of the law. But just because somebody comes up in court and pays your fine for that offense, that transgression of the law, does and fulfills that obligation of paying that fine and that penalty, does not mean that the 25 mile an hour speed limit has been done away with. No, that is still there. The letter of the law is 25 miles per hour. The spirit of the law, the Holy Spirit comes down and is poured out on all flesh, that makes us understand that the spirit of the law is that 25 mile per hour zone is for the safety of the people in that residential neighborhood. To keep us safe from not driving like crazy maniacs so that all of us can go from point A to point B through that residential center area without running over kids, without hitting the, the neighbor's dog, etc. So that we have the letter of the law and we have the spirit of the law and we understand how that is applied in both situations, how it comes together that we understand, well, I don't know why you're writing me a ticket, you know. There's other people who are worse than me. Well, you're not here for what other people did. You're here for what you did. So either we're going to walk in obedience and not transgress the law, and we will get from point A to point B in the time that we need to in a safe manner for us and all of those around us, or you're going to break the law, There'll be a fine and punishment and penalty. And if you run over the neighbor's dog or, Lord forbid, their kid that pops out of the driveway with a bicycle and you kill them, now what have you done? Your lawlessness has created death. Okay, and that's the, the best way that I can put it. But <clears throat> what the Messiah ended up doing is bringing these things together. And so people that say, you know, well, uh, the Sabbath has been done away with, you're under a burden and a curse, and people get really mad at that real men, you know, keep Torah. Um, that's, I got some, some really nasty messages on that, and it's like, how dare you? You're that, that Hebrew roots messianic plot, and it's like, no, it's not that. It's a scripture thing. It's a God thing. If you look, I mean, there's, and just like I said, there's extremes on both sides uh, when it comes to law and grace and love. So too are there extremes uh, in the denominations. There, there's extremes in the Protestant, all the Protestant denominations. There's also extremes, um, people in the Hebrew roots, the Messianic faith, Messianic Judaism. There are some that believe that if you don't observe the Sabbath, you're going to hell, that you're not really a believer. Well, that's way out in left field because Scripture doesn't believe that. Yet there's a lot of people who will say, well, look, the Hebrew, I talked to this Hebrew roots guy, and I saw it on the Internet, and it says that this guy says this, and, well, well, that's the extreme. Let's look at Jim Jones. Let's look at the, at the hundreds of thousands of cults that are out there in Protestant denominations that reject the Messiah. <clears throat> I mean, it's just, so you can't go and say, well, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You can, and we're supposed to, but the thing is, we got to go back to Scripture and see what it says. If God says that his Sabbaths, uh, are perpetual and everlasting, and we see them in the new millennium for all mankind, that all men shall come and worship me on the Sabbath, that the temple will be opened up when the Messiah returns, and the so-and-so gate will be opened on the Sabbath, and people will be able to come and worship. Uh, I thought you said the Sabbath was a burden and a curse. 
Mr. Grace Love guy, don't like the law guy. So you're saying that God, our Father, and the Messiah are coming back to put all of mankind under the burden and the curse of the Sabbath and the feast of the Lord? It, so you see there's a, there's a breakdown in the, in, in the sequence in which these people, they'll pull the scripture out of context. They do not see uh, the context of what you're reading. Uh, they'll pull this, the, the one out in, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Romans 14. I've talked about this before. We'll pull out a scripture in Romans 14. It says, uh, scripture, it says, is one man esteems one day over another, so another esteems another, so in your heart, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the problem is, and they'll say, you know, see, that proves I can, I, I don't have to do the Sabbath on Friday night to Saturday night. I can do it on Sunday. I can do the Sabbath on every day of the week. That's the way it should be. No. Problem is, that's not what God's word says. God said, boom, here's the deal. I'm setting a point in time for my, my engaged, my betrothed, my beloved, a special time, a date night basically is what it is. It's a special time where we get together. He says that I'm giving you that we can come together. <clears throat> if you were betrothed to your significant other, and you said, oh, sweetie, we don't have special date night because every day is a special date night. Sweetie, you know what? Anniversary and all that stuff, that's every day's an anniversary with you, sweetie. Yeah, see how that works. Okay, it doesn't. God our Father does not institute a thing that, that, that does away with the special times that we have, like our anniversaries. Uh, he, it doesn't do that because the picture of that marriage wedding ceremony is there are those appointed times that lead up to the uh, the wedding ceremony. So those times and even times in the in the Hebrew uh, the Jewish wedding ceremony is the uh, the bridegroom would come and he'd give a gift. Boom! What what gift do we see? Pentecost pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Wow! Want to be one of the wise virgins whose lamps are full of what oil? burning, action, verb, doing. Don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word, because the doers of the word will be justified. Oh, wow. You know, some people say I have faith, but, uh, you know, you got to have works, and you show me your works, and I'll show you my faith, but you can't show faith without works, uh, that whole thing. I mean, it's just amazing on what we end up seeing is that people go to the extremes and say uh, that I don't have to do this stuff anymore. I don't have to do this, and they'll pull scriptures out of context, the steam one day over another. Romans 14 doesn't even have the word Sabbath in there. It's about eating. Read the entire chapter. Matter of fact, there's only, in the entire book of Romans, there's only once where the word Sabbath is used, and it has nothing to do with what's, what's being talked about in chapter 14. So what we need to do is get back to God and his word. <clears throat> but the problem is so many people will say, well, I'm under the new covenant. I don't have to do that anymore. And the thing is, is that a new covenant, a new contract, it's, it's, and some people will go to the exchange and say, well, no, it's a renewed covenant. And they'll go to great pains and say, well, it is a renewed covenant. The problem is, is that uh, it's not a renewed covenant. It is a new covenant. And I want to go over some of this stuff here. It's, it's interesting because, um, uh, yeah, we see that, that uh, veil has been placed over the eyes of a lot of people because they go, don't go back to God's word. They don't go back to his good doctrine. Uh, we see many people who believe the Messianic faith or the Hebrew roots go to great pains to say that it's a renewed covenant. But if this was the case, then why does the New Testament references call it the new covenant? The word new in the New Testament describes the new covenant is uh, Strong's G2537, which is kainos. Uh, and the biblical usage is new, unused, unworn, recent, fresh, of a new kind unprecedented, uncommon, unheard of. Hmm. New covenant. Unheard of. So the concept that God's law, his instruction would be written on our hearts and minds, and that's a byproduct of us being a new creature in Christ, is indeed unprecedented. Who thought that the Messiah would come and lay down his life for the Jew and the Gentile? That is unprecedented. <coughs> <coughs> that he would be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Uh, it's just incredible. So anyway, the thing is, people get caught, caught up in this, this idea of the new covenant. Well, it's a new covenant, and it's totally different from the old. 
but we see Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, that, that there's a lot of things that still apply in this new covenant. And then I want to kind of give this little story. Let's say you're renting a two-bedroom, uh, one-bath house, and the rental agreement, that contract says, here's the responsibilities of the landlord, and here's the responsibilities of the tenant. That's kind of similar with the contract or the covenant is a type of contract that God made the contract because he owns everything, just like the landlord owns the house, that he makes a contract says, these are the things that I will do. These are the things that you as the tenant will do. Isn't it funny how it's really, really similar to the wedding contract where the bridegroom says, these are the things that are my responsibilities and duties. You as the wife which you are going to be under my covering, that these are your duties and responsibilities to be the pure bride so that we make it to that final wedding date. Boom, we'll become one flesh and we reproduce life. Um, the problem is, is that people think that, no, 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 no it's totally new. It's, it's the, the old, the old, the old, behold, the old things have passed away, everything is new. But yet when we go to Jeremiah 31, not all things have passed away. What has passed away is the record of sin. What has passed away is our, our inability to be um, made holy before God and made acceptable by, uh, by God through the sacrifice of the Messiah. <coughs> Excuse me, unprecedented. Um, let's go back to landlord thing. So we got this contract. Here's what the landlord's going to do. Here's the responsibilities of the tenant. And if we do these things, we'll have a good relationship. Uh, you'll have a nice place to live, and so on and so forth. So let's say, anyway, it ends up that the landlord, he comes up, and what he ends up doing is he's saying, hey, here's the deal. It was a two-bedroom, one-bath, no garage. What I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade it to a three-bedroom, two-bath, uh, two-car garage, and we'll even throw in a hot tub and a pool in the back, okay? Uh, put in grass, and we'll update everything. We'll put new appliances, new uh, new refrigerator, washer, and dryer, the whole nine yards. He's going to upgrade it to the point. But this upgrade requires a new contract. Now, what's really interesting is the landlord did the upgrade. There has to be a new agreement, a new contract. But in that contract, the responsibilities of the landlord and the tenant are still the same. There's only a very few minor things that have actually changed. They upgraded the house from a 2-1 to a 3-2 with a, you know, two-plus garage and, and a, you know, hot tub in the back. <clears throat> he improved all these things, new appliances, but the duties and the responsibilities are still the same. The only thing that changes is the price. And isn't it interesting that our Messiah paid the ultimate price for us to be made acceptable to God when we repent, confess, believe, and we become a believer. Okay? Excuse me. So when we get to that place, so there is a new contract, a new covenant that is made, but in the majority of the aspects, it's the majority of it is the same. The only thing that's changed is what is the upgrade? What did the landlord do? The landlord upgraded some things, and there might be a, a you know, <clears throat> So there has to be a new contract. If you've been in real estate or been a landlord or real estate investing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've rented a house and you went from a little 2-1 to a 3-2 and you rented that, uh, there is a change. You have to have a new contract, okay? Whenever the landlord, if you don't know this, if he makes upgrades to that property, let's say he just puts a carport, there has to be a new contract, okay? <clears throat> indicating what he's done or that the changes has been made because you want to be uh, in the clear because what happens is he comes back and says, hey, the tenant put in a carport. I didn't authorize that. Then he can take you to court, okay? Or vice versa, you know, well, I got hurt on on this carport because it wasn't installed prop. So that's why there needs to be a change. That's why there's these rules and these regulations, uh, these laws and instructions and so that each of us knows what our duties and responsibility is and that everything is above board. The cool thing is, is again, like I said, is that this new contract that we have from God is now his commandments and instructions weren't written on tablets of stone, but now they're written on our hearts because we're a new creature in Christ. 
And the other scriptures talk about and say, you know, well, uh, there's going to be a time where I'm going to write my laws on their hearts and minds. My laws will be written on, on hearts of flesh. Well, the only hearts of flesh that is acceptable to God are those hearts that, have, that are new, the born-again believer. So anyway, uh, that's basically what it is. The old covenant to the new. The majority of the responsibilities are the same, but uh, there are some minor differences. But if we look, the majority of, are still the same and carry over into that new contract. Just read Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. But anyway, it ends up that the new covenant started. When did it start? You know, some people try to say that, you know, the new covenant hasn't really, really, really started yet. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. You know, this is kind of a fringe way out in left field. But it's only going to happen. The new, new, new covenant isn't going to come into effect until the Messiah returns the second time. The problem is, is that that's false because uh, it ends up, it says that uh, Matthew 26, 28, Mark 14, 24, Luke 20, 20, or 22, 20, 1 Corinthians 11, 25, and again, the Hebrews 8, chapter 8, 9, and 12 talk about the new covenant is when Yeshua took the cup and said, this is the cup. This is the cup of my blood, the new covenant. Bang. So it starts there. It hasn't been completed because heaven and earth is still here and he hasn't returned, but that new covenant has started. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, what people will also end up doing is say that since, well, there's a change in the priesthood, there has to be a change in the law and the law has been done away with. However, most Protestants are taught that to believe that this change is that the law was done away with. But, you know, that's not the case. The change was that our sins are forgiven, totally forgiven, not just covered by the blood of animals, but totally forgiven because of the Messiah's death on the cross. Our sins are thrown, thrown away as far as the east is from the west. Wow. Okay. Um, again, also that, our, that the law was not written on tablets of stone, but it's going to be lit, written on, on the fleshly hearts of people, written on the hearts and minds. Imagine that. <clears throat> but uh, it ends up that... Uh, we have a father as new creatures in the Messiah. The only thing that has changed was us, and he did it for us. So in other words, he made us. He took our, our, you know, we're filthy and sin and yuck, and nothing that we do can justify us before God. No amount of following the instructions of God, but by the grace of God, we are brought into the kingdom of our new creatures in Christ. And that's salvation, by grace, not of works, that anyone should boast. After salvation, now we see clear teachings in Scripture that we're not supposed to engage in sexual immorality. We're not supposed to cheat our neighbors. We're supposed to love our neighbors, love our God. Uh, you know, that Paul talks about in writing and saying, hey, you know, if somebody starts fasting on this day and, and fast from certain things, that's fine. And another person doesn't, that's fine because that's what the Lord has laid on their heart to do. But when it comes to the Sabbath of the Lord, Paul observed the Sabbath. He taught on the Sabbath to both Jews and Gentile believers. An entire city came, and that city was filled with Jewish believers and Gentiles that believed in pagan gods that came and listened to Paul on the Sabbath, as was his custom. He never, he never, you know, it doesn't say that he missed the Sabbath. Wasn't Sunday. <laughs> okay. So we really need to look at our, our theology and what we believe. And is it based on Scripture? Or is it based on out-of-context scripture? In other words, does it end up being uh, something is added to God's good doctrine or is something taken away? So anyway, um, <clears throat> really what it comes down to is that we are made acceptable before God by what the Messiah did on the cross. So as a new creature in Christ, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, by no means we're supposed to establish the law. Our pattern and our life and our behavior is supposed to be holy and righteous before him. It says, be holy as I am holy. That hasn't been done away with. So, you know, we really need to start looking at the scriptures. Think about that contract. Think about the changes that have been made. The law is still there. We see passages in the New Millennium talking about the Sabbath and the Feast of Tabernacles and that those... Coincidentally, the same things that God said, these things are forever. They are perpetual. They're everlasting. They will not go away. We see them in the new millennium. So maybe God knew what he was talking about. Maybe he really meant it when he said forever, if we see it in the passages of the new millennium. So with that said, um, <clears throat> I think it's really important that you know we look at these scriptures. We look at 
you know, people would say, you know, well, the law, the law has been done away with. The Sabbath has been done away with. Really? And why do we see it in the new millennium? Why do we see that all mankind can worship God on the Sabbath? Why do we see that all the nations of the world, not just the Jewish nations, not the tribes of Israel, but all the nations shall come and they shall keep the peace of tabernacles. And if they don't, they're going to be punished. It won't rain on their, on their countries. Wow, huge. How come in the temple, when the, when the, when the temple comes down and the Messiah rules and reigns for a thousand years, when it says that the gates will be open on the Sabbath, what are you saying? I thought the Sabbath was done away with. There will be one flock consisting of Jews and Gentile believers, all mankind. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Talk about that in Acts, Peter's vision. It's not about, you know, you can, you can eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want, but it's not going to be beneficial to you. There's going to be a, a, a consequence for eating the things that God said, who if we are created in the image of God, says this is what I see as good for food for you. It will be a blessing for you and your children for all generations. Just saying. So if you're eating a ton of pig and a ton of pork and all of a sudden you find yourself, your rheumatoid arthritis is getting worse and worse and worse and you get more, you know, there's... <laughs> Why, why would you want to eat something that's the garbage disposal of the land? I think food, it ends up that pigs only eat, uh, pigs eat and their digestive system is like three to four hours. But it's interesting, and that's an unclean animal that we're not supposed to eat as food. Yet all the clean animals that God dictates and says, this, these things are to be food for you, it takes a long time for that food to be digested. Either that or they only eat plants. So it's like, wow, huh, maybe God knew what he was talking about. Maybe the pigs that will eat anything and everything and don't sweat, you've ever heard the term, oh, so you're sweating like a pig. Pigs don't sweat. So the toxins that come from what they eat isn't excreted, actually kept inside the meat of the, the pork, the pig. It's basically a garbage disposal. Same thing with lobster, shrimp, shellfish. All of those things filter out toxins. Think about it in the ocean. <clears throat> I know I'm getting sidetracked here on, on the dietary instructions that God set forth for his people, the mixed multitude, you know. But even then, the Gentile believers, you know, uh, you know, God said, hey, if you're one of the chosen people, you know, if something dies on its own or whatever, you know, eh, something, you know, you're not supposed to eat that, but you can give it to the foreigner. Hmm. Do you want to eat like one of God's chosen people? And we are grafted into Israel, according to Romans 11, and adopted in the family of God. And, you know, Isaiah and Ezekiel talk about the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, who observe the Sabbath. They will be given a name greater than sons of daughters, and they shall be on a special place uh, on my holy hill. It will be a house of prayer for all nations. Again, it's talking about the millennium. So why would we not want to take that into consideration, saying, you know what? I think I'll just eat what God says is good for food. Can't hurt. There's no commandment that says I can't. There obviously is some health benefits to eating and what God says to eat. Science has shown that eating a lot of pork is bad for MS. It's bad for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, <clears throat> we've been off of pork for so long now that uh, one time we had, we had uh, pizza and it had pork on it, sausage, and we didn't know about it. And the whole family got sick off a piece of pizza. But we've never been healthier than any other time of our lives. So it's a blessing. Eating the things that God says, following his instructions isn't a burden. It's like, oh, I can't eat pork. It's so terrible. Oh, I have to eat all these healthy foods that will benefit me so it will go well with me and my children. I'll be able to see my daughter walk her down the aisle. I'll be able to hold the grandkids in me. You know, you never, you never see that. You know, that... that but yet it's funny because in Protestant Christianity, the majority of denominations will say, you know what, those dietary instructions have been done away with. 
and they'll reject it to their dying day. But if their doctor says you need to cut out the pork and the fat because it's bad for your heart and your health, all of a sudden people say, oh, well, Dr. Johnson told me I need to cut off the pork if I wanted to live a long and happy life. Seriously? Dr. Johnson isn't saying, he, he, he didn't come up with that new bit of information. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. All Dr. Johnson did was rehash what God set forth in the beginning, our Father, our Elohim, and says, this is what is good for you for food. So it will go well with you and your children, blah, blah, blah. Imagine that. So, now, on the flip side of the coin, if you're obeying these things because you're trying to justify yourself or trying to make yourself look holy in front of other people, I don't eat pork. No, no, no. You know, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. If you're doing it because you're trying to take grace and saying, well, you must do the Sabbaths, you must do the feasts, and you must eat what God says in order to be saved, uh, I don't see that in Scripture either. Okay? Thief on a cross. Yeshua didn't say, you know, today you'll be with me. Oh, no, you won't be with me in paradise because you didn't observe the Sabbath, you didn't do the feast, and you didn't eat what, what the Father told you to eat. All bets are out, sorry. No, that's work salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. Matter of fact, the thief on the cross wasn't even baptized. That just ruined a whole lot of theology out there right now. But God in his mercy, his love, and his infinite wisdom knew that, hey, there's going to be people that can't get baptized. There's going to be people that, that died in the Holocaust said that there was no water, the thief on the cross. But yet, that person, that thief, who repented and confessed and believed in the Messiah, would be with him in paradise that day. Our God is the God of second chances, second, third, fourth. His mercies endure forever. But the problem is we get to the point where we think we've been given so much mercy and grace that now we're at a point where we don't have to be obedient at all. And that's not what Scripture says. But look at the context of God's Word. Look at Romans 14. It's about eating and fasting. It's not about the Sabbath at all. But yet that is what we're being fed by one extreme in Protestant Christianity, in the Protestant denominations. And you go to the other side and say, no, nope, Yeshua can't be, the, can't be the Messiah. Well, gee, I wonder why. Because over here we've changed the Messiah to be this Torahless, uh, lawless individual that says, ah, the law's been done away with. Do whatever you want. I came with new words and instructions. I came with new authority. But he didn't say that. Scripture actually says the Messiah, Yeshua, actually Jesus, actually says, I have not come of my own authority, but of the Father's. The words I speak are not mine, but of the Father's. Wow. We need to rethink our doctrine. Because now what God has ended up doing, instead of God's word having to work on an oppressive hardened heart, of those who are stiff-necked, now he's allowed us to be a new creature in Christ where his law is written on our hearts and minds so that the byproduct of our relationship produces good fruit, which is obedience to his instructions. The thing is, there seems to be this dividing line. Uh, you say, are we supposed to be obedient to God? Are we supposed to love God, love our neighbors? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Are we supposed to do the Sabbath? Nope, 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 nope. Feast of the Lord? Nope, 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 nope. Eat what God tells us to eat? Nope, 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 nope. Why is there that dividing line? People say, well, because that's the ceremonial law. The Sabbath and the, and the, the dietary laws and the Feast of the Lord, those are, all diet, those are all ceremonial laws. No, they're not. Show me where it says that. Look at the Ten Commandments. There's no tabernacle at the Ten Commandments. There's no tabernacle in the beginning where God sanctified the Sabbath and called it the Sabbath and made it holy. Why do we see Cain and Abel? Abel presented a lamb offering Passover. Why do we see that? 
And there is no sin, there is no transgression, there is no punishment. If the law wasn't given until Mount Sinai, then why, why was Cain punished for murdering if there was no law? There's no law, there is no transgression. There's no transgression, there's no fine punishment or penalty. Why was adultery wrong? Why was stealing wrong? Why was murder wrong? Because obviously, God had already given his instructions, his commandments, his precepts, his principles to Adam and Eve during the time when they walked in the garden. However, us in our American mindset and our Greek mindset or whatever, the mindset that we have is foreign to God and alienated from God, that we don't think that and God says, hey, as they're walking through the garden saying, hey, these are the things, you know, see this? This is good for food. This over here, oh, it tastes great. That over there, no, that, that's the garbage disposal. Don't eat that. We need that, that pig thing to clean up all the junk that isn't good for us. See that lobster and that crawfish and, and uh, the clams and the mussels and, you know, mud bugs and all that stuff? Yeah, that, that's for cleaning up the garden, cleaning up the dead things, cleaning up the toxins for mussels actually and shellfish to actually circulate and clean the waters in streams and oceans. So the amount of, I think it was uh, one report, I think it was like 50 gallons a day or, or some kind of crazy thing. It was like, wow, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be eating mussels. Maybe we shouldn't be eating eating crab and shellfish and all that stuff because it it's it's the garbage disposal. It's, it's the ultimate renewable uh, energy green technology of making things clean, making dirty water clean, getting the toxins out, uh, out of the world and making it safe. It's a garbage disposal. Just saying. So, I mean, you see these websites that talk about, and they say that, you know, the, the Hebrew Roots Movement, the Messianics, Messianic Judaism, or, you know, anybody who obeys the commandments of God or Sabbath keepers or, you know, obey the feast and observe the feast of the Lord, they're under a burden and a curse. Really? Hmm. Remember the new millennium. Something's wrong. <laughs> and it's probably with us. It's not God in his word. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So anyway, I know this is a long video, and I've rehashed a lot of this stuff before, but I just wanted to, to let you know about this and talk about these things, and that you know, the law has been done away with, and really, seriously, our obedience to the Father has been done away with. Hmm. And if we obey from the heart, from a circumcised heart, the byproduct of our relationship with him, that we observe the Sabbath and do the feast and these things, is because he loves us and we love him, and we're able to grow closer. There is, there is no law against that. It's kind of like the, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kind of self-control, so on and so forth. Against these things, there is no law. And the same thing. If our heart is right with God because of what the Messiah did on the cross, me observing the Sabbath and the feast of the Lord, guess what? That's acceptable to the Father. So... Don't send me messages saying, you know, you're going to hell and you're, you know, you're a heretic and, you know, you've fallen from grace. Because your argument isn't with me. Your argument is with the scripture. And it's interesting because every time I get somebody who sends me a message, it says those exact same things. And I show them the scriptures in the new millennium about the feast of the Lord and about the Sabbaths and, and all those things. Even the, even the passages where it says, you know, that uh, the abomination of, of those in the, in the uh, tribulation, of those, the abomination of eat the, uh, eat the mice, eat the pig, eat the swine, and the mice. Wow. Tribulation is still in our future. Swine and mice are an abomination before God, but that this is after the Messiah came, lived, and died, and was resurrected. Hmm. What's going on? Is my denominational beliefs in conflict with what we see in God's Word? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe we need to rethink some things. So, um, but every, do everything out of a circumcised heart. Do it because God lays it on your heart to do. 
and it's not a burden. If it if it's ever laid on you that it's like, oh, I can't handle this. If it's terrible, but I got to do it. That's not of the Father. Okay. So something's wrong. Our perception, our understanding is wrong. Our heart is wrong. It's never the Father. It's never His word. Never His word that's wrong. So anyway, that's it. So take care. God bless you.